Hello, 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 everyone. How are you doing? It's about 2.30 in the morning where I am. And uh, I'm a bit nervous, but hey, we'll get through it. Um, I'm nervous because this is actually my first nurse crime video. Remember a while back, I was telling you guys that I wanted to make this channel about nursing and also about nurse crimes. Um, it could be about serial killer nurses, student nurses, uh, healthcare workers, but mainly nurses that are involved in some type of crime. And um, I have done a lot of research on this I will put the description of all of my resources I will put them down in the description box so you'll see where I got it from I mean this particular nurse um, I decided to do her first just wanted to start off with a bang and it is the infamous Elizabeth Wedlofer She's a Canadian nurse. And Canada didn't even have any um, serial killer nurses before her. She was the first. So she put them on the map. With this act that she committed. And I'm going to make this... Uh, I'm going to break it down into a part one and a part two because it's just so much that I would like to cover. And this is in no way intended to insult, degrade, make the family members relive or trigger anything with anybody. It's just getting this out there. It's still people that may not even have even heard of Elizabeth. And what she's done and it's just putting it out there because you consider a healthcare worker as someone who was going to be there for you in a caring manner advocate on your behalf to the doctors and other ancillary staff be in your corner just you're you're basically one of your heroes you know in your health to getting better that would be one of the last people you would look at and say, I'm looking in the face of my killer. This is the person that's going to end my life. You don't look at a healthcare person and think these things. You just don't. And I would like to make a part one of just breaking down what happened, how it started. And part two, I would like to give sort of a follow-up of the changes that took place after this case. And uh, do not forget, Cash App giveaway is still in full effect. It's going down April the 8th. Cash App or PayPal is acceptable. So don't forget, like the video, subscribe to all my channels, and I'll list them for you. Leave a comment, hashtag birthday, and leave your cash app or PayPal information in that same comment. And I do have someone, um, my virtual assistant is keeping track of who's subscribed, who's leaving the most comments, who's doing everything it says to do on my banner in order to be qualified to win this $125 cash gift. And like I said, I will be doing this uh, four times a year. I'm a little late getting started, so I'll do another one real soon. So I really want to break it up into every three months, like three, six, nine, twelve. So March, June, September, and December with the pot growing a little bit bigger every time. And I would like to give a shout out. I have over 100 subscribers now. I am ecstatic. I am hum humble. I am just deeply appreciative for everyone that's following me, really listening to my content and not just like 30 to 60 seconds of it and, 
you know, I appreciate everyone that's actually taking the time to get to know me, to see what I'm about and what my content is about. And this is my first crime video, so I would appreciate an honest thumbs up, thumbs down, um, you know, positive criticism on, you know, advice, what I can do better. You can leave it in the comments or you can email me at she nurses tv at gmail.com either way i would greatly appreciate it because i expect each video to get a just a little bit better each and every time you know there's so many um content creators that are in the true crimes mystery murders all of that and they're doing a fabulous wonderful job and i love them all so I want to be like them when I grow up. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take my time with this, guys. So please bear with me. Like I said, this is about serial killer nurse Elizabeth Wetlaufer. Okay, and I'm going to be incorporating um, different sites on here and let you know where I got all my information from. And another thing that made me want to do her first is she's a night shift nurse. She was a night shift nurse. And I'm a night shift nurse. I'm like, oh, why, why you gotta make us look bad like that? Come on, Liz. Why you gotta do us like that? Well, she prefers to be called Beth. Is what I've learned in my research. So, Miss Beth was a night shift nurse. And she uh, moved to Canada around the age of four years old. Now, according to a neighbor who was also a childhood friend of hers, she was shy, a bit awkward, um, kind of was a target for bullies. Because, you know, anything that doesn't align with the norm you're probably going to get bullied and that sucks i was bullied as a child and especially in high school it just sucks it sucks but uh, according to the neighbor elizabeth beth as she preferred to be called did grow up in an ordinary household both of her parents were in the house her parents were married uh, she was um, in choir in high school. She was on the hockey team. I mean, just your your normal type of kid other than the shy were, shyness and awkwardness. After high school, she thought she may have wanted to do journalism, but she only did a year of that, decided against that. Now, I do want to add that she did battle with her sexuality on and off growing up and we'll we'll get into that later because I think that plays a part in her actions following as well so journalism she decided that wasn't for her then she went to uh, Baptist College and she got a um, a bachelor career at Baptist College she got a bachelor in religious education and a minor in psychology now Going back to her sexuality, her father, you know, and her mom, they, they upheld this standard. They didn't believe in same gender loving. I'll go ahead and put it out there. So I think they kind of knew something was going on with her as far as her sexual preference, because while she was in college, and I do believe it was at Baptist College, her father enrolled in the college as well to sort of kind of keep eyes on her. You know, and then it was found out that she uh, even joined a gay-friendly church behind their backs, and they were not happy about that at all. I mean, her brother, due to this, sorry if y'all hear the train, I live by train tracks. <laughs> he even stopped talking to her for about 10 years behind her sexual preference yeah so her mom was just kind of making an excuse and say oh that's just her roommate you know she has a roommate and they um kind of look out for each other and they care for each other so 
she chalked it up to that but she didn't stop there she did continue to go to um a math and science um college for she did that for a year and then she ended up going to nursing college i believe it was uh stratford where she went and she did three years in that nursing college and that kind of sealed the deal on her career she was able to relate to nursing more than anything okay and she eventually decided to start working in long-term care now if you don't understand what long-term care is it's basically when for some reason whether it's old age some kind of traumatic brain injury stroke car accident that left you paralyzed and you have paraplegia plegia now you're paraplegic or you know something that interrupts your normal way of living where you have to have 24-hour care basically that's where long-term care nursing homes come in you know you your children may be grown married raising their own kids and they may have moved out of the state and can't care for you like that that 20 you know giving you that 24-hour care that you need so they have to make the hard decisions to place their loved ones in nursing homes long-term care homes eventually to make sure somebody is there with them 24 7 to look out for their loved one you know that you know they're placing their loved one in the hands of strangers but they're trusting that because they you know took some kind of oath to say i will do good you know the the greater good for the people i care for they're not thinking that they're they have any kind of ill intentions they don't know that people in the healthcare field do suffer from mental illnesses as well. They do. And quite a few of them do take medications for it. And Elizabeth was one of the people that suffered with mental illness before she became a nurse. Had a long history of depression. I'm pretty sure it was behind the bullying and struggling with her sexuality. She had, um, I want to say it was bipolar disorder as well. She had anger issues. She was taking medications for her mental illness. She was hospital several times, hospitalized several times, several times. And I kind of wish that with learning what I know about her, I kind of wish that, you know, that would be a part of the interview process. Do you have any form of mental illness? If so, are you taking medication for it? Are you in counseling for it? Have you been hospitalized for it? I think that's important. I honestly do. It's showing that you're you're wanting to protect your residents, your patients, and your facility from any harm coming to them. So here we go. She's out of school. She's got her license. And she lands her first job. Lands her first job at Crescent Care. Crescent Care um, is a 32-year-old business. They have about 160 residents living there. We call them residents here in the U.S. So residents, patients, whatever you want to call them. They have 160 residents living there and it's the biggest of its kind in that county okay this is in Woodstock Ontario so they described her as 
happy, eager, excited, a good nurse. You know, she had a good reputation initially. Who would have thought she'd be responsible for eight murders? Eight. Eight people lost their lives under this woman's care. And we are going to talk about each one. Now, Crescent Care had five wings. And uh, I do believe she eventually got to work all five wings. She was the registered nurse who had um, what she called RPNs under her. So I'm guessing that's what we call LPNs in the States. It's a registered nurse and then there's several licensed uh, practical nurses that work under that registered nurse. So she was a charge nurse on night shift. You know, so I'm pretty sure she uh, had patients herself that she was taking care of. And then she was overseer over them. And then I'm pretty sure they had CNAs there. I believe um, maybe two or three CNAs were on the night shift. They are responsible for vital signs and keeping them clean and keeping them dry. And the nurses more were more responsible for medication um, if they had any wounds, changing their bandages on their wounds, assessing their uh, heart, lungs, and things like that, making sure they're <clears throat> avoiding properly as they should. So everybody were, was doing their respective jobs, okay? So I'm going to go back to the summer of 2007. Mr. James Silcox, World War II veteran, was her first victim. James Silcox. <clears throat> Sorry, you guys, I am going through my paperwork because I don't want to miss anything anything at all okay and mind you she was making 60k a year that's pretty good for 2007 i'm just saying 60k a year starting off that's pretty good as a new nurse because new nurses couldn't even I couldn't even fathom making that much if I was a new nurse okay so let's get back to Mr. James Silcox which is her first first victim like I said he was a World War II vet and um, he suffered from strokes he had developed dementia and he ended up um, hurting his hip I don't I'm not sure if, if he fell I don't quite remember what happened but he ended up hurting his hip and his wife you know she was older as well I believe Mr. Wilcox was 84 years old and his wife just couldn't care for him at home by herself so the family eventually made the heart-wrenching decision to place him in a long-term care home and that's what they did now I believe it was two months after Mr. Silcox got into this no he was 80 years old i'm sorry he was 80 years old not long after he uh after she started i say two months after beth started working at this long-term care home he was found unresponsive in his bed 
That means, you know, they're calling his name. He's not saying anything. And upon further investigation, he actually was not breathing. So, his daughter was notified. She was shocked. She was in disbelief. And the doctor actually said that it was an amb- an embolism. Like maybe the, the hip surgery caused an embolism. Like a post-hip embolism. You know, sometimes you get clots and they break off and wreak it in your system. Like, okay. How would they know that without an autopsy? Because the family never got an autopsy. They were shocked about his passing, but... They were telling the family that it was a possible heart attack and then said it was a post-hip embolism, blood clot. They didn't think anything suspicious about it. And this whole time, Beth is knowing that she overdosed this man with insulin. The whole time she knew this. Now, I want to point out something. In her um, confession, which I'm going to leave the link to that. In her confession, she stated that once she murdered these patients, she made sure she was off the next day or two. She made sure she was off work because she didn't want to deal with the guilt. I was like, wow. 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 So yeah, old Beth made sure she was off. She she let them do the, the paperwork 99% of the time because she clocked out, she went home. She wasn't there to deal with it. Oh my God, okay. And sometimes she even went back, you know, and kind of looked over the paperwork just to see what they marked, you know, on his paperwork, you know, because it's paperwork you have to fill out after each death, and then you have to call, you know, Red Cross or the organ donation facilities to see if they're a candidate, and you have to do all that. Sometimes she said she even just went back and looked over the paperwork. Her curiosity got the best of her. All right, let's go to her next victim. Now, this is 84-year-old Maurice Granite. Granite, please forgive me if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Nickname was Joe. Had a history of prostate cancer. I do not believe he was diabetic. So, uh, he was a mechanic. He became a resident in December of 2006. So, he became a resident before um, Beth started working there. He had a bad fall. And he was um, just not the same after that. You know, I was reading um, or listening to a podcast that says, fall of The fall is a leading cause of death after After uh, falls can lead to death after falls in the elderly. They're the number one cause of their death following a fall. That's why I get so, you know, every time I had a patient fall, I would just get so worried because I noticed right away. I mean, right away, you notice a change in them. They don't heal properly. Even mentally, they don't act the same and they don't live very long after that. So there is a connection there. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Mo, he was found by his, um, the night shift, unresponsive, unconscious. So I'm pretty sure one of the 
CNAs probably went in there maybe to take his vital signs or something. And he was unconscious. Guess what? Beth gave him an uh, overdose of insulin. Yeah. She gave him an overdose of insulin. Sure did. Now let me let me break this down what she said. Let me break this down. And thank you for being patient with me. Her first victim, James Silcox. She said he was horribly inappropriate. She said he would say things about his wife, touching staff inappropriately, touched her on her breast when she was in the alone, alone in the room with him. It's like she was shifting the blame on her, on the actual uh, victim. And he was not a diabetic either. Yeah. And, but, but let me tell you something that I discovered on my investigation about this. His inappropriateness was a part of his care plan. Yeah, it was a part of his care plan. You know, when you develop dementia and as it starts to progress, you don't think the same. You don't act the same. And a part of that is inappropriate language, you know, inappropriate actions. He was care plan for that, meaning that was a part of his care plan. So there was a plan in place for his care for the inappropriateness related to the dementia. So what would you normally do if that's a part of somebody's care plan? You redirect them. You redirect them. It's constant redirection. Like, no, we can't do that. No, we don't do that. Remember, that's not that's not appropriate. Remember, redirection. They're forgetting things. They're doing things. They're thinking things that they wouldn't otherwise think or do if they were in their right minds you know and she said she even said she tried to kill others before him he was just her first successful victim and that sounds so bad coming out like that I believe she made I don't know anywhere from two to four attempts before she finally succeeded with Mr. Silcox. Just think about that. How lucky were those people? How blessed were those people to not die at her hands? Now she claims, I'm still on the first victim. I had to go back, guys, that she had a feeling in his in her stomach. She got a good feeling. That she was about to go off the deep end and do something. And she says she believed it was God telling her to do it. She had a sense that God was going to use her for his purpose after her divorce. Yes, she was married. She was married to a truck driver. um, And it didn't work out with him because she just decided that she was the same gender loving. You know, so... Yeah, I'm pretty sure, Beth, that God wasn't planning on using you this way. But I digress. So after she gave him, she said 50 milligrams of insulin. I'm hoping that she meant 50 units because in the States we say 50 units because 50 units is a lot, you know, for a non-diabetic person. She says she gave him 50 milligrams, but I'm just going to assume she meant 50 units. Um, Borrow from another patient. You know, like insulin is not a narcotic. It, it, it's not being monitored. It's not being um, t- 
count it like a narcotic. You know what I mean? It's not a part of the narc count at the end of the shift that we have to do as nurses. Each patient had their own pen with their name on it. And then there was an extra pen available for emergencies. And then there's another uh, cabinet or, or, or locked medicine cabinet in case one of those patients run out and they can replace it, put their name on it and keep doing their work. Now, after she gave that overdose to the first victim, she says he was saying, I love you. I'm sorry. You know, like she did this at like 930 at night. He was saying, I love you. Just hollering out until about 330 in the morning, guys, 330 in the morning. Like then he just slipped away like he was in agony for six hours. Wow. Mm. You know, I just, how evil can you be to just know what you did and you hear somebody saying, I love you, I'm sorry. And you're just like, mm, okay. Well, so when they found him, the first victim, Mr. Silcox, she went through the whole, the whole protocol. She listened to his chest, his heart. She listened to his lungs. She heard nothing. Just went through the, went through the, uh, pro- the protocol, the usual routine. Post death, notify the doctor. All of that, and all the while on the inside, she says after she killed each victim, she heard like an evil laugh in her in her gut in her chest. She heard a laugh of, and, and she felt a sense of release and relief. It's almost like she was taking, her, she was, it's not almost, she was taking her anger and frustrations out on them. And it was like a drug to her. It was like a, another drug to her. And yes, she was on uh, recreational drugs as well. She admitted that she was um, addicted to hydromorph. She was addicted to another form of morphine and pill form. She was still in that from work, saying she was to giving it to residents and was popping it in her mouth. Sure was. And she said, when I came to work high, I didn't make any mistakes. And we'll get into that later. We'll get into the mid errors later. Yeah. And in her interview, she's it's just so sick. She stated that she assumed him saying, I love you. He was just talking to his family or maybe his wife, you know. Yeah. After her first murder, she she said she felt awful. She literally went home, talked to her girlfriend because she had a girlfriend by then, exercised and went to bed. Mm hmm. Sure did. And of course, made sure she was off the next day. Mm hmm. It's Miss Beth. All right. And like I said, her second bit victim was 84 year old Maurice Granite. Granat. Maybe it's Granat. And they called him Mo. And she overdosed dosed him on in, insulin this was um in october of 2007 now mind you she just started this this job you guys she literally just started this job in 2007 and like two months later she gets to going you know what i'm saying she goes on Mr. Mr. Mo and I quote from her interview she says he was another one that liked to grab breasts and asses. Mm. Really? Now mind you what I said earlier most of these patients had some form of Alzheimer's or dementia which greatly affected their normal way of thinking. 
It greatly affected that. And to turn around... And somewhat blame them for something they obviously could not control. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And please forgive me if I get any of these dates wrong, guys. I made a lot of notes. But two days before Christmas, Christmas, she overdosed Mo with insulin. He was struggling to breathe. By morning, he was deceased. And his obituary stated that he quote unquote passed away peacefully so the families had no clue they had no clue some of these family members even hugged her saying thank you for caring for my loved one thank you not knowing they were hugging their loved ones killers can you imagine how they are dealing with this every single day They, they. Uh, I hope they're able to forgive themselves and and have some kind of peace at that. You know what I mean? And of course, after overdosing him, she was off. She was off. She, she her excuse for giving him that shot. She said she told him the doctor wants you to have a vitamin shot. Like, wow, who's going to argue with that? Who's going to argue with the doctor wanting to give them a vitamin shot? It's going to help, right? Nobody would argue with that. Mm-mm-mm. Victim number three is Miss Helen Matheson. Miss Helen Matheson. Now, uh, in her interview, Beth described her as uh, very quiet, very determined, seemed to be waiting to die. Oh, I mean, as a nurse, if I if I thought somebody was just waiting to die, maybe they have a just a blank stare, just like no sign of life in their voice or their eyes or anything like that anymore. So I don't know what her definition of how she was waiting to die is. So, you know what? Since she had this waiting to die appearance, according to Beth, she had a gut feeling. Here comes the gut feeling again. Saying that, okay... She's going to be next. So, Beth said she made a fuss. She made a fuss that night. She was very lucid. She claims that she went to Walmart to buy Miss Matheson um, her favorite blueberry pie and ice cream. Said she ate about three or four bites. Like, she went and got this stuff like it, like she's like giving the woman her last supper before execution well i mean but but damn that's exactly what she did that's what she did that's what she did went and gave her 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 last meal sort of sort of free oh anyway so she gave her the three to four bites of blueberry um, pie and ice cream. And she gave her insulin. Not long after that. And now the detective's like, how do you know how much insulin to give these people? She's like, oh, I don't. You know, it's just a hit and miss. Like, she's basically just trying to see what works. You know what I mean? She's literally saying, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just giving them a lot. 
and hoping that does the, the job. Sounds like it's trying to storm out there. I'm like, oh my God. She says she may have gave, given her 60 units. She doesn't really remember. She says she had nothing against her. She just had that feeling that it was it was her time. And she said after she injected her, she said that the, uh, Miss Matheson may have said, ow. And then she goes on to, to, you know, tell the detective the symptoms when he asked, you know, what are their symptoms? You know, what, what, how do they act after you inject them with all this insulin? She said they get diaphoretic, meaning they start sweating profusely. They get shaky. They lose consciousness. Some of them had seizures. Some of them had strokes. Like, it, like can you imagine dying that way? Nothing peaceful about that. Come on. Like, wow, this woman, this woman was really off her rocker. Really off her rocker. And, you know, I can't help but to wonder if if people were working around her and like, oh, my God, every time I follow behind her, somebody is dying. Like, you cannot tell me that somebody did not have a feeling of their own, like something is not right here. Something is wrong. You cannot tell me that that they weren't whispering and wondering. Like, if I came behind her so many times, I would does would have been the first thing I would do. I would be like, maybe come in two or three hours early just to check sugars or something. I don't know. I, 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 I you know, I'm pretty sure they're beating themselves up too. I can't, you know, I don't want to make anyone feel terrible because this this is truly tragic enough and I don't want to beat someone while they're down because it's a lot of coulda shoulda wouldas in any situation and as a nurse you know a normal thinking nurse you always wonder could I have done something better could I have done something different you know you always want to do your best at all times a normal clear-headed nurse yeah. Okay. Now, I did say she had a girlfriend by this time. And I do want to point out that before um her third victim, her and her girlfriend had broken up. She had actually went on a cruise. And um, her and her girlfriend were broken up by then, but they still had a cruise set and they decided to still go on the cruise, okay? But her girlfriend decided, hey, something's not right about this chick. Something's not right about this lady. I'm just going to kind of do my own thing, break up with her. Now, her girlfriend even had a mom that was in the hospital, and she wanted Beth to meet her mother, and Beth was not even interested in meeting her mother, and that was like a red, for, a red flag in the to the girlfriend as well. She's like, okay, how come you don't want to meet my mom? That's kind of weird. So, but she broke up with her, so she came back. Did you notice her first two victims were men, and then she comes back and starts killing women? That really stuck out for me. So it's like now I'm going to start. Now you're all of a sudden getting these gut feelings about women now since your girlfriend broke up with you. First, she was divorced, two men, and then she breaks up with her girlfriend. Now she comes back and now you're getting these gut feelings about women. That just really stood out to me. I was like, hmm, okay. Number four is Miss um, Mary... Zurawinski, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. She was a, a patient of Crescent Care. She wasn't a diabetic. She did have dementia. Now, Liz, aka Beth, described her as um, feisty. You know, so feisty, I'm thinking, hey, she she kind of holds her own ground. You know, she, she, she tells what she thinks. She speaks her mind. Because she says she could talk. She was feisty. And then she says one night, uh, Miss Mary told her, I'm going to die tonight. Won't you put me in the um, 
in the deathbed. Deathbed is meaning in the uh, palliative, palliative care room, basically. They have a bed in there where they just keep you comfortable, um, as comfortable as possible up until you pass away sort of like hospice but they are two different things i won't get into that in this video i'll do a separate video on that and and beth was like oh it kind of took her back she was shocked she was like okay she assumed this was her go she's gonna play angel of death again here we go you're next you kind of wanted i'm gonna be your savior type of thing she gave her a dose of insulin ended up giving her another dose of insulin that night and um two days later she was gone she was gone and she really did put her in the, in the deathbed she she moved her over there when she started going down she did now she says that this was actually the first victim. Ms. Zerowinski was the first victim that she tried long acting and short as acting insulin on. You know, there's an insulin that brings your blood sugar down really fast. If it's 300, maybe you're going to get 12 units of an short acting insulin. I mean, it's going to work on it right then and there. It's going to drop it real fast. A long acting insulin is going to work uh, in doses overnight. It's just like a slow releasing throughout your system through the night to, to bring it slowly down overnight and to get it to a level with the normal limits. So this was her first victim that she gave both of them to. Both long acting and short acting. So she stepped her game up. And here she is playing with the insulins again, and she died. She did die two days later, y'all. This woman just, wow. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Whew. I was just in shock. I said shocked, but I was in shock, I would say. And, of course, you guessed that she was off the next day. Now, by this time, you know, eventually, I'm not going to say by this time, but eventually she did start talking to people. It's like, y'all, this is crazy. She was not getting caught. She wasn't like nobody was on to her. She started talking. It's like she just couldn't hold it in anymore. She started telling people herself she even confi confided in a lawyer she eventually confided in a lawyer and the lawyer said take it to your grave don't tell anyone whoa yeah in her interview she said the lawyer said take it to your grave don't tell anyone just get help is what the lawyer told her mm-hmm And she told, she didn't only just tell the, the lawyer, she, uh, she told a couple of close friends as well. And they were all saying, promise us you'll get help. Promise us you'll get help or we're going to have to turn you in. I'm going to just let that sink in for a minute because uh, I was speechless as well. Okay. Let's go to number four. Number four is Miss Gladys Mallard. Miss Gladys Mallard, um, if I'm correct, she did have diabetes. She actually did. Um, she had, uh, according to Beth, severe dementia. And uh, she said uh, when Gladys first got to Crescent Care, she was uh, walking, talking at first. She she started laughing during her interview. It was like she once punched a man 
for uh, mistreating an, uh, a, a woman, another resident. She was very stubborn. That's how she described her. So she said one evening, she got that gut feeling again. There she is. And she decided to overdose her with insulin. Now, after she started mixing the long acting with the short acting, that was her choice then. That was her how her combination to in in these innocent people's lives. It's very interesting that she said she never got this feeling outside of work. Uh, I, I doubt if you get the feeling outside of work, you know, you're around people that can defend themselves. Sure. I doubt you got that feeling outside of work too, ma'am. You just want to go to the people that can't defend themselves as good as people outside, you know, working, walking and talking and with more strength. Uh, Beth described her as very stubborn so she said one evening she got that feeling gave her uh, some insulin and um, of course she passed away she eventually passed away as well And even Elizabeth, even Wetlawfer was shocked that she never got found out. She never got, she eventually got fired, but she was just shocked that she didn't get fired and found out right away, put in jail. Well, we know she eventually did, but it even plagued her that she was getting away with it. She was even shocked. She even stuck, um, got on this website where they wrote poems and she started writing these dark poems about her crimes yeah she started writing poems about it like (sighs) like it's almost like she was wanting to be found out like some part of her was like okay kind of want people to know Still no autopsies. Still no autopsies. Number five. Helen Young. She had diabetes. Dementia. And according to Beth, Helen was miserable. Not happy. Wanted to die said said that she was always willing behind them saying help me help me help me i want to die help me die according to beth that's what she was saying so one night you guessed it she decided i'm going to help her die and she did just that with her insulin cocktail. That's what she did. Now, on this particular death, you know, when she passed, somebody was like, okay, let's take her blood sugar. She said she pretended to take her blood sugar. Knowing full well it was going to be very, very low. But she pretended to take it and said, oh, it's fine. And the the CNA never questioned her. Never questioned her. So by now, I will tell you, by now, the co-workers are whispering. 
they're whispering about how she's acting at work, how she's starting to bully other co-workers, how she just was angry at every little thing. One nurse even caught her just talking to a patient saying, it's okay to die. It's okay to let go. And that struck a, the nurse as like, oh my God, I cannot believe she said that. Like, people are whispering. She was showing up. Like I said, if I hadn't said this before, she was showing up late for work. She was calling in more. You know, the drinking's out of control. Yes, she had suffered from heavy drinking, drugging, even went to one of her neighbors when, when she was, you know, needing drugs and was like, can I get some of your medical marijuana? You know, she hit a hit a bad rock now. She did go to, um, checked herself into a mental hospital a couple of times during this. It's like she was trying, she was trying, but then she would fall right back into that cycle of working again, killing again, working again, killing again. Yeah. And like I said, y'all, these family members were thanking her for caring for her loved ones. They really were. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, I think that was number, yes, number five. Let's go to number six. Um, Maureen Pickering. According to Beth, Maureen was a handful, attacked other patients, pinched them, pulled their hair, hit them. Like, uh, according to Beth now, Maureen got so out of control that she had to have one-on-one monitoring. Someone had to be with her at all times. Be within uh, one-on-one monitoring uh, in the States. We have to be at least one arm's inch from them. So if they try to get up or anything like that, hit people, hurt themselves, we're right there to intervene. So, one night, Beth, a.k.a. Elizabeth Wetlawfer, had to sit with um, this resident. She had to sit with Maureen because there was no one else available to do it. She was charged. It was her responsibility. So, she decided one day that she had to help her die, too. Mm Mm-hmm. She was tired of the one-on-one monitoring. Now, she said she didn't actually try to kill Maureen. She was just trying to uh, more like sedate her, get her to calm down so they can have a better better handle on her. She just wanted her to st- settle down. She said so she uh, just deliberately, you know, gave her something to help her calm down. But guess what? She gave her insulin, too. Yes, she did. And you know what eventually happened? The same thing. The same thing. She eventually had some of the symptoms and passed away. Mm hmm. This is just wow. Like, how do you go home and sleep at night after this? How do you go home and sleep knowing what you've done? I don't get it. I'll never understand. I'll never understand. You know, and I know it just shocked everybody because this is a nurse. This is a health care worker. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now... Okay, she eventually, um, I mean, another thing, she was suspended four times for medication errors, you guys. She was suspended four times. She was disciplined nine times. Like, how many chances do you give someone to mess up? I've never heard of that. And I'm, and I'm a registered nurse. 
You get four suspensions. You nine. Mm, 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 mm. I've never heard of anything like that before. Like I'm thinking after the second time, you're you're gonna be on probation all over again, just like you're a new employee. You're going through there all over again. Somebody is going to be watching you. One-on-one with you. One-on-one monitoring. No way would... No way should I think someone be given that many chances. That many chances. Like, she she made so many medical errors, they eventually turned her into the, the Canadian Board of Nursing... Which, and I believe she was in the nurses' union, so they eventually helped her get out of that trouble she was in, that Crescent Care. Um, Crescent Care, I mean, they eventually agreed to give her a $2,000 resignation bonus, you guys. They gave her a $2,000 resignation bonus, promised to give her a good recommendation at her new job. Like, wow. Why? 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 You didn't have to give her anything. That's the part I don't understand. I don't get that at all. Why? And so now she's at Meadow Park. Now Meadow Meadow Park, a representative ended up finding her resume online and they actually called her in for an interview. During this interview, she admitted, hey, I was fired for medication errors. And who, the, the, whoever was interviewing her at Meadow Park was like, okay, we believe in second chances, so we're going to give you one. And I, be, I bet they've regretted that ever since. So she's at Meadow Care. And eventually, I don't even think she was at Meadow Care for even uh, 90 days. I believe I heard somewhere that she was there for a month i mean the research is all out there guys for you to follow up and hear this for yourselves i'll leave the everything in the description box everything that i saw it's so much more to this i'm just trying to um condense it down for sake of time you know so this is her seventh victim here at meadow park arpad horvath arpad horvath And according to Beth, he was mean. He would grab the nurses and uh, the PSWs, I'm guessing those are the CNAs, whenever they would try to do things for him, twisting their arms, punching them, very difficult, difficult to care for. You know, can you just believe how she's just blaming them? Blaming them? Mm -mm 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 -mm. So... She gave him. She had the gut feeling. She decided it was time for for him to go. And um, she gave him insulin, of course. And, of course, he has some of the symptoms. Had a severe stroke. They sent him to the hospital. Then another nurse, you know, said... You know, Lizzie, his blood pressure was, I mean, his blood sugar was extremely low. And she tells Beth, the killer, I did some research and sometimes it says a bad stroke can cause the blood pressure to go really low. And this just tickled Beth. She literally laughed in her interview and said, that's what she said to me. She was laughing. Knowing that she really injected him. A couple of times with insulin around 7.30 and then again around 9.30. And she, I quote, she said he fought it. He fought everything. Wow. Mm -mm 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 -mm. But he ended up passing away in in the hospital. And his son was notified and his son made it, you know, in time to the hospital too. To talk, you talk to him and tell him, you know, it's okay to let go, but just not knowing that he was actually murdered, but he was able to make it to the hospital before he actually died. Mm. 
yeah so from uh i say from let's say 2008 to 2010 she didn't commit any murders but it's not like she didn't try just the attempts were unsuccessful either nurses came in after her and you know were able to check their sugars and um get them help get them get their blood sugar levels back up thank god for the nurses that that saved the ones that she was not able to to kill or the ones that you know their blood sugars might have been so high that it actually brought it down to normal and she probably was shocked that they didn't die you know what god was with some of these people thank god for the ones you know that the nurses came in behind her and actually actually were able to save and she said that she said it she said sometimes they came behind her and were able to to save them i mean it, you guys have to watch this interview if you haven't watched it like she was just so nonchalant about everything about everything you know and i was just waiting for some kind of emotion to to you know come from her anything and there was none there was none i was just looking for some kind of tear to to drop from her face nothing nothing at all i was like wow unbelievable unbelievable and i want to say that during this interview she was not even under arrest she wasn't under arrest at the time of her uh interview with the police she sure wasn't she was just coming in and and retelling her story And they were just like, wow. Like, at one time in the interview, she even said, um, um, am, am I going to get to go home? I need to know, you know, that my parents are okay. I'm like, really? You're thinking about somebody's parents, your parents, and you've killed somebody's parent. You're thinking about your loved ones, and you've taken their loved ones away from them. Mm, 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 mm. Wow. I might have got I might have gotten off with my count, but she had eight victims, so I'm hoping I got them all on here. I will correct myself as I go through the video, but I'm hoping that I did cover everyone about this. But her victims' names in case in case I missed one, I do want to and I will have their um their names up here as well but she had a total of eight victims it seems like i left one off but i'm still gonna have them up here and like i said guys this is my first um crime video ever made so i hope i didn't bore you too much i hope i didn't do too bad of a job you know any kind of corrective criticism would be great honestly like it or dislike it either way i'll be able to learn something from it but she did have eight victims called lethal injections so and the podcast is a canadian crime podcast they did a very 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 good job i mean they go into details a lot of these um these crime shows go into detail so please check it out in your spare time and uh just just not you'll you'll learn all you need to know about this but yeah she is in jail of course she went to prison now she did go to prison and you know the family did uh keep up with her of course they want to know where she is at all times and uh so i believe it was 
um, either Mr. Silcox's son, I believe it was Mr. Silcox's son, that um, found out that she was moved. And they weren't telling the family where they moved her to for privacy? For, for privacy's sake, her privacy, get this now, they didn't tell her where they moved her to. So he had to go to the media. He had to go to the media and put them on blast for not wanting to tell her location. Yeah, he put them on blast. And so after being media shamed, they finally told the family that they had moved her to a mental health facility with no security, minimal security, minimal guards, and she's there getting treatment yeah Mm -hmm. yeah shame shame so please check it out and um it's more it's a lot more uh, nurse serial killers than you think are out there and i'm going to be covering more of them It takes a while to do the research, but I'm going to get better and better. I promise. But there's more. There's more. She is not the only one. I mean, United States, Japan. They're everywhere. Just about. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Like it. And the, uh, like I said, the Cash App is still going on until April the 8th. I have not forgot about that. It is still going on. So continue to follow the instructions and enter your chances to win that free cash. Okay. And I will talk to you all later. Bye.